I'll go ahead and start uh, recording. Okay. I'm going to show the entire screen, I guess. Sounds good. All right. Fantastic. Hello, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us, uh, joining the Houston Java user group meeting this, uh, this July of 2021. Um, glad, so glad you're here. Tonight we have Eel Wilransky. Is that, am I pronouncing that correct? Um, Eel? More or less. I, I, I pronounce it as Virzansky, but it's. Virzansky. It's... Okay. My apologies. Thank you. Um, and so uh, thank you so much for, for being here. And uh, thank you to Improving for sponsoring the streaming hosting. Um, I work, uh, full disclosure, I work for, for Improving. Um, if you're interested and you want to go to the website, it's, uh, it's uh, improving.com. Uh, it's a great company to work for. And we're always happy to, to help you improve your business. Um, and uh, I can't say enough good things about it. I just celebrated my one year anniversary as an employee. And uh, it's just a fantastic place to work. Um, and if you want to check out the Houston Java user group, um, you can go to www.hjug.org, H-J-U-G.org. Um, the uh, website is, a, is a, a work in progress. Uh, right now, it'll point you to the Eventbrite page uh, for our for HJUG organization. I uh, hope to have a GitHub page up soon. Um, so without further ado, Eel, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. C can you see my uh, slide? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm going to talk about machine learning and, and a little bit about deep learning. And uh, with Java, meaning I, I will actually try not to use anything that's not Java, but I think most of the presentation is how to get started with machine learning in general. And, and a lot of it will be not necessarily Java specific, but I will use Java tools. Um, but we also discuss Java tools that, that are available out there. <clears throat> so uh, these are some, some things about me. You're invited to, to connect with me. I have been a Java developer for many years. I also write some code in Python. I recently uh, became officially a data scientist, but I've been doing AI and ML for a long time. And um, I, I also run the, the Jacksonville Java user group and an enterprise AI virtual user group that we started before everything went virtual. Uh, so you have a link for that. And I have the AI for Java blog where I write about Java uh, tools, so I can show you here. This is what it looks like. There is this is a page from it. It doesn't have a lot of material. It has two two uh, big chunks of materials that are relevant, and I mentioned them a little bit today, that are worth uh, going into. And uh, I um, I wrote the genetic algorithms book that is not a very relevant to our talk today. It will be a little relevant at some point. I'll mention it, but uh, it is and it is written with Python. But uh, more relevant is this uh, low-hanging machine learning uh, for Java developers, which is part of the low-hanging low, low project. This is an ebook you can get it for free, so I will get to it uh, a little later. But uh, what I'm talking about is, is actually a lot of it mentioned in that book. Um, so let's start diving into machine learning. Um, so what is it? Uh, it's hard sometimes to define uh, its um, definitions that you see here are some of the definitions um, the idea is maybe a program that you're not really writing the program the program writes itself the, the program has some experience uh, i'll try to make it more um, um something that you can actually see and uh, it will be hopefully easier to understand uh, there, are, there are several types of uh, machine learning and the three main ones are, are mentioned here supervised and supervised and reinforcement Supervised is still the, the largest uh, one uh, in what we do. Uh, most, most of the applications that are uh, today are, are, are there, uh, are supervised, and this is what we're going to talk about today. The other ones are very interesting, even more interesting to some degree, but, but less. There's, we're still learning them. We're still more in the, the, in the maturing uh, times for them. So supervised, uh, by the way, so we, we can see here, this is the cheat sheet from uh, uh, Azure, I think. And it just says, if this is if you want to do this, the, the first column is what we would call the application. And on the right column is what it's called in the sense of uh, machine learning. Uh, and if you see those, those that are, are marked now are sort of what we're going to talk about today. Those are supervised machine learning types. And the rest of them are either not completely supervised or at, lo at, at all not supervised, but we will not talk much about them, even though each one of them could be a whole world by itself. Um, and and there, are, there are some commonalities too, but 
Uh, let's uh, so let's go more into this. Uh, uh, so supervised learning, the idea is we have uh, inputs and outputs, and uh, we want to create this um, um, something. I mean, we call it so we call it the model usually, but you can think of it uh, a program. Let's say that you want to write a program that uh, gets uh, inputs and produces outputs, just like you know a, a function or um, a method or some program that that you enter some information and it does all kind of calculation, gives you something back. Uh, the problem is we don't exactly know. We don't have the we don't we don't have the algorithm that that maps those inputs to those outputs. What we have is examples. We know that if the inputs are this, then the outputs is, are that. We know this from experience. We know that if this happens here, then that happens there. For example, if we think of a, a house, we can look at the at the book and say, okay, if the house has so many rooms and uh, this zip code and uh, near near the school and whatever else parameters, then the price of the house is going to be so and so or in this range. Uh, so we have a lot of examples maybe, but we don't really know how to map, how to do the mapping. So this is where machine learning is supposed to figure it out for itself. Basically, we will uh, supervise machine learning. We will supervise, we will, tell, we will tell this model, you know, this. if this is the input, that's the output, you know, and that's another input, another output. Figure it out for yourself. Uh, the way it's implemented is there is some, uh, the model is actually some kind of a program or an algorithm or um, Let's call it, a, to think of a program that just has a lot of variables in it, and the variables can have different values. Uh, and we just, this is a very powerful program that can map pretty much any input to any output if we have the right values of the parameters. So the learning is actually changing those parameters until the, those outputs start to be what we want them to be. And there is some internal algorithm that knows how to change those parameters. So the, what we need to do is just show the examples uh, of what's input and what's output. And that uh, algorithm, that algorithm that is internal to the model or part of the model, will go and do all this tuning. Think of it like a radio with a lot of buttons that you need to to find the exact same the, the best place for them to be. And more than two, usually if you have more than two, a person cannot really do that. So you need this algorithm that was created uh, somehow, and uh, that will try to find those internal parameters. You may not even see them, but you will see at some point that the inputs, uh, for what the inputs that you put in, you will get hopefully the outputs that you wanted to see. If the model is uh, complex enough and uh, it can learn it uh, in a reasonable amount of time, then you may get what you want. Uh, so these models are implemented in all kinds of ways. Uh, one main family is all kinds of decision trees and decision tree basically said okay if this input is more than sorry if this input is more than five and this input is less than two then we'll go this way and then and it can create a huge tree and many times it's just a whole forest of trees that work together there are many algorithms that work with trees another one are, um, family is neural networks and that goes into deep learning that we will mention it later and then there are some others so we will see all this i think i basically i went to all these um these next slides just by looking at while while showing you the, the previous slide because of the visual, but this is sort of what I was talking about. Uh, so we can uh, we can divide uh, that um, input and output supervised learning to two main um, applications. One of them is called classifications where we give it the inputs, the inputs are called features, and uh, the outputs are are labels which one of the labels will be true and then other labels are not. So it's like making a decision between several labels. So for example, uh, the classic uh, hello world example is called the iris uh, classification problem. So we have uh, those uh, people in the 50s, I think, that went and, and uh, they were researching um, the iris of three, three species of iris and uh, they measured the leaves, the petal leaves and the sepal leaves. <laughs> they took the length and the width. So the idea is uh, we have now a data set. We say it says basically if these, these are the length and the widths, then it's this kind of iris, etc. So um, this is what classification is about. You you get certain inputs and you need to say which kind, which one it is of the of the output. So normally one of the outputs will go high, the other one will go low. And uh, this is how you decide. This is the label. And a common, a co a common um, use case is that it just there is just one output that either goes high or low, and then you say it's either it's a binary case. It's either this or that. Like you said, example. Oh, we'll we'll get to this in a second. 
For example, uh, do you get credit or you don't get credit? Person is sick or not sick? Are you the person that's supposed to be or, or not, etc.? Is this email spam or not? Um, what we see here is another example of, of classification. It's a little bit more complicated. And here we try to recognize, we take a handwritten digit from a, a also a very um, famous database. It's called the MNIST handwritten digits, uh, which are some examples are here. So um, what we do with, with each, each sample in this database, it was digitized and it was normalized. So it's a uh, 28 by 28 pixels. And each pixel pixel can have a value between zero and fifteen, which for the that denote the gray level of the pixel. So we can do the same thing that we did before, and now we will have seven hundred and eighty four inputs. Each one of them is a number between zero and fifteen, and we will have ten outputs, which are represent the different digits. And in this case, if it's a three and it figures it out, then the three, the one that represents three, will go high. Ideally, will go high. The rest of them will go low, and then we can say, okay, the model detected that this is a three. What we're going to see a little later is in the case of image, classi image classification, which is this is an example, can, it can get very um, unruly because the images can be very large. The number of pixels can be huge. It could be colors, different layers. So you will have a lot of information and we may have to do some something so this will not get out of control. So we won't have so many inputs. And also in the case of images, there are some certain things like two pixels that are closer to each other are probably more similar than two pixels that are in a different size of the picture. So we want to take advantage of that information that how close they are together and not just take them all as, as just inputs that are unrelated. So uh, for this, uh, there are special models, let's say. Uh, so let's continue meanwhile with, with that. So the, this was classification. And um, the, so, so far we were looking at these three um, kinds of classification at the bottom. And the other one is called regression. In regression, it's very similar, but the output is, is uh, one usually. It could be several outputs actually, but the idea is the output is continuous. Uh, like in the case of the house, uh, market value of a house that I mentioned before. So you have all kinds of inputs about the house. Let's try to see what, what the house should be sold for. And other examples are what you see here, uh, like what would be energy consumption given the temperature and um, maybe the, the previous week's uh, consumption, etc. Um, and these are uh, models and algorithms that go with them, um, some, some names. So a lot of them are decision trees. Random forest is actually also a collection of decision trees. Linear regression is logistic regression. Uh, and actually, logistic regression is, is a classification algorithm, so it's a little confusing, but these are uh, the more original things that used to be used by statisticians. Uh, and usually, uh, um, when we have an, a more complex issue problem at hand, we will go to some, some other. Um, so I think I would say right nowadays, the main two families are decision trees and artificial neural networks that are also go as deep learning sometimes. <laughs> And I'm going to give you now a sort of a crash course in data science, which means what happens when um, a data scientist uh, or just somebody, and now we have the term that's of citizen data scientists, I mean, anybody can become a data scientist and do stuff. And there are tools that are very powerful, and I'm going to show you one right now. Uh, the other uh, like you're about to tell a joke. What happens when a data scientist dot, dot, dot? <laughs> Well, I know a joke about a DBA that goes to the <laughs> goes to the bar and he sees the table and says, "Mind if I join you?" <laughs> but uh, I don't have one uh, about that Sandy's. But but actually, there is something. So, uh, um, for example, there is something called the confusion matrix that you see here, uh, and we will see what it means soon. And somebody asked me, "How come there is no band called confusion matrix? It's such a good name for a band." Uh, so maybe uh, you'll have a bunch of data scientists making a band. Um, so um, these are some things. A lot of these are a lot of the things that, uh, as a data scientist or a citizen data scientist, you will encounter. And I'm, I'll try to to at least give you an idea what these things are and sort of what. So what I'm going to do now is sort of go through what what you would go through when uh, when you go to solve a problem uh, of the types that I mentioned before. So there are other other kinds of problems that I'm not going to touch, but the problem that I have in mind is where you have a data set that is 
Uh, we call it tabular data sets, and it's basically a, a table, but these are the most common data sets, and this is what usually goes into classifiers and regressors. Uh, so I have a data set that actually I found, uh, thanks to Stephen, that uh, told me that he's interested in uh, predictive maintenance, which is one of the fields that uh, we use uh, classification. The idea is um, this is one, one interesting application where we have a, a machine, it can be anything, an elevator, a windmill, any kind of machine, and we want to know in advance, we sort of want to predict that this machine is about to fail, and maybe we should replace a part. Uh, so this is a, a data set that was uh, sort of generated artificially. Uh, but it, we can look at it, you can think of it as a, as a real one. It doesn't really matter for our purposes. Here I have it in Excel. Do you see my Excel? Can I make it bigger? Do you see the Excel spreadsheet? Okay, so uh, I open it in Excel just to show because this is you see Excel and and it could be a database table. The idea is that uh, and this is what we usually call a data frame. It's a it's a collection of rows. Each row can be different type. So you have like a string, you have uh, integers, you have floating number, and here these are called enumerated or categorical because if you see here, there are only three types which actually have some uh, like medium, low, and high, which have something to say about the quality of the part. Uh, and uh, so there are all kind of measurements that you get about the, the conditions uh, that were measured. And maybe you may have sensors in this machine. There is some, some maybe a, a drill or something that, that rotates. And you have sensors that tell you those numbers and you need to predict if there is a failure looming if it's time to maybe replace that before a failure occurs. So as you see, the failure is just um, yes and no. It will be zero and one. Uh, what you don't see here, but you will see soon, is that a lot more zeros than ones. The one uh, is a rare situation where there is a failure going to happen. And here I actually break down of what the type of failure is, but uh, but this is like an all of all of these. So if there is one of the failures, then you will see it here. So we will just we just want to generally look for a failure. We don't necessarily care what what type of failure. We just want to know that there is a problem and we need to do something about it. So the question is, if we look at those as inputs, can we um, can we predict the output correctly? Can we say, okay, we have this machine has has this information and um, light and a, a, a light bulb or something that says um, we have a problem. Let's replace the machine. Let's put it aside. Put a new machine instead and take take care of it. So uh, in many cases, data sets look like this. What I wanted to tell you, though, there a lot of the work of data scientists, but sometimes that, that you have different kinds of data scientists. You will have, it's a teamwork. So uh, you have more people that do this and more people do that. But in any case, a, a big chunk of the work that you won't see here is collecting this data, um, cleaning this data, putting it together. Sometimes it's most of the work, and we, it, we don't really do that here. We have that that already. Uh, there is also what is the data, you need to decide what is the data that's available, what is the data that's important, what I think uh, I want to put in this data. And uh, you may have um, experts, uh, SMEs, that will tell you this is the data that should be important for you to collect, uh, uh, etc. So uh, we are sort of past that. We will just continue from that point. And if you go to websites like Kaggle, which is where they have contests, uh, for um, predicting, etc. They usually you will have that already at uh, this shape or form, and uh, this data set comes from here, from uh, the UCI. So you have a lot of data sets like this lying around. A lot of them are public, and you can take them and do things with them, and they'll give you all kind of information like here uh, about the data set. So and actually here it actually it, somebody somebody generated it. A lot of the data sets here are, are real; they are not generated, but it tells you how it was generated, what the things mean. Um, and uh, here I have another one. Oh, that's, we'll talk about this later. But like the iris data set is everywhere as well. Um, so we, let's, our starting, our starting point is this. And now I'm going back to the book. If you scan this uh, or take, or, or copy that link here, it will take you to a place where you can get the book uh, for free. It will, it will take your email address and put you on my mailing list of this AI for Java website. If you want the book and not, if you don't want to have to to use your email, etc., then you don't want to go on my mail list. Just uh, reach out to me, and I'll give you the book. Um, so this book uh, has uh, those a lot of what I mentioned now concepts of machine learning, and then it uh, mentions 
um, low hanging tools, which are basically the idea is um, very powerful tools that uh, that can that can take you uh, forward quickly uh, without a lot of uh, learning curve. So this is the one tool that I'm going to show you is mentioned in this book. And I'm actually going to go much deeper into it. The book just talks about it in general because the book is is basically a, a, a short book. Uh, and this is very visual. So now that I actually uh, I am um, facing you, I can actually go in there and show you what I'm doing with it. So this is an, 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 a fantastic tool called H2O Flow. It's made by H2O, which AI, which is a company that has a lot of products, uh, quite uh, may, maybe not a lot, but several products that are very um, powerful. Uh, and a couple of them are free. This is a free product. It's actually written in Java. But when you use it, you don't necessarily know that because it is all done through user interface. Um, and that's also how usually data scientists work. They, they do things uh, from a notebook, if you ever seen, but usually in Python, you, you, they write code and they immediately see the result. This is sort of a notebook, but you don't really write anything. It's all almost almost nothing. It's all done pretty much with, with a click and point or point and click. And we will see that. And it's self-guided in a way. So let's go there to, to be able to use this tool locally. You have to basically before that, let me show you the website. I have I have the, did I have the link here? Let's go back to my presentation. So it, I posted it in the chat as well. So it, here. so it looks like this. It, it talks a lot about it. It's all kind of, there is a lot. It's been around for many years and, and it's it has a lot of documentation. So um, to so it tells you how to get this uh, jar file. So it's a jar file that you launch like this. Can you see that? I can maybe make this a little bigger. But basically, I do Java minus jar H two O jar, and it will what it will do. It will actually spawn um, a web server. I think it was a jetty. I just saw that, uh, and it will eventually tell me to 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 go in my browser, and um, it will tell me where. Here it says it here. Where is my mouse though? Here. It tells you go here, and I may already have it, but it's dead. So I'm going to revive it. Where is it? So um, what we see is this. I don't see it yet, but I hope it's coming up. <laughs> this. Um, uh, so you have a lot of uh, help on the right side, and it sort of tells you what you can do. So the, the flow is usually you have a file, you have a data set. It's usually represented as a CSV. So what even though it's an Excel, it's not really a, a, I don't say I, I, it came from a CSV. So it's actually a text file where you have commas. It's a comma separated. Each row is what you see here. Uh, and you can open it in Excel, of course, uh, but uh, you will now open it here and you will import the file. And the hardest part here is actually tell it the name of the file. I'm not sure why, but it's always giving me problems to tell it what file I want. So here is the name of the file. And we'll put it here and hope that it listens to me. Oops, what did I do? Oh, yeah. Sometimes it just doesn't want to do it. But today is my lucky day. But this is the only place I have difficulties is actually to come to here. To tell it the file. So now that it's in, I need to tell it to import. So now I have the file, and uh, I tell it to pass the file. And I guess you could you could do it with several files. Um, so do you? Is this large enough? Can you guys see it well? I can no. see it. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Does anybody else have any issues? Let's see what happens if I enlarge it a little bit. I oh. can see okay. Um, but again, I'm at. Okay, uh, uh, Dave said all good. So thank you, Dave. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you let me know if please if there is anything in the chat because I can't see the chat at this point. So, yeah, no, I'll, I'll be I'll be your eyes for that. So we're you're in good shape. Don't worry. So I guess it can. There are different files that it can do. I only did CSV with it myself, and then it figures out the separator was a comma, and that the first row the first row con first row contains the name. So here it put the name it put the names here. Um, and now it basically figures it out. It says, it says, okay, the first row, so the first column actually, the columns that we saw at the, at the Excel here, they show here horizontally. So this was the first column and it figures out it's numeric, this is a string. Here it figures out that it's enumerated, there are only three values, etc. 
the only thing is those values here that uh, are the failures, it actually thinks it's numeric. There are only zeros and ones, but uh, it, it doesn't know that it thinks that zero and one are just numbers, and I can say, no, it's actually enumerated. And I can keep doing doing it for the other ones, but I only, I'm only going to use this machine failure. I don't really care about those, the other ones, which tell me exactly which failure it is. Uh, so I can leave it alone and I can just say pass. Now that I pass, uh, this is a place where data, data scientists will go and play all kinds of games and we look at the data, uh, which is what we do here. I will not do as much, but uh, for example, you can look at uh, a type. So it's three types. So you can see that um, most of them are L and some of them, etc. You can see the distribution of uh, the values. Um, you can look at, uh, let's look at just one more other thing, temperature. So you can see it, there is some distribution. There are, it's not exactly normal distribution. If you look at uh, maybe at the torque, it will be, look at the rotational speed. This is more of, of a regular, regular looking distribution. Um, also, um, data scientists many times want to see the correlation between different or the correlation between all of them to see which ones are like redundant. You see the same information twice, really, because they're really correlated well, or which ones are more unique. And you can do a lot of other things. And uh, this is a stage that's also called feature engineering. Uh, besides the feature engineering, uh, one part of it is when you decide what features to include, but a feature engineering can also be combining these features together or taking them apart. Or let's take a date. Instead of a date, let's just figure out if it's a Sunday or not a Sunday. Uh, if it's a um, summer month or other months. So you, you can take uh, some more of this raw information and turn it into other features. This is called, this is called feature engineering. Uh, and there are probably, you can just also combine them. You can do, let's try this feature times times this feature and minus that feature. I don't know, if you really want, you, you could maybe try this if you, if you think there is a value to it. Sometimes there is. Uh, so we don't do any of these. We'll just take these features. And now that uh, we have it, uh, we can also view the data, etc. But um, it also tells us all kind of information. Uh, you see, none of them have missing values. Sometimes you will have missing values, and then you have to decide what to do when you miss. If one of the middle value is missing, maybe you will just uh, delete that row where the, there is a missing value, or maybe there are a lot of missing values, and you delete the whole column and said, "I don't want to mess with with this." If the air temperature is only there in half the cases, maybe we just will not use the air temperature. Uh, and it gives you some other min max, etc., uh, statistics that you can maybe do stuff with. So this is data scientists can spend a lot of time looking at that. Uh, we will we will be more practical at this point. We'll continue with what we have. Uh, so the next thing you do is usually a split, where we want to take this data. This is all the data we have. So we want to split it at, at least to two. And usually um, this is one ratio that is common. It's seventy five percent and twenty five percent. And uh, the idea is we want uh, to use some of it for, for training the data, the, the model, basically where I, I tell it this is the example, this is the result. But then I want to keep some of them on the side so I can see how well it generalizes. Because remember, at the end, you want to show examples that it never seen before. And this is the true test. If the model actually learned the idea and not just memorized those examples that because theoretically, if the model is very powerful, it can just memorize. It will know that this is the input, this is the output, right? And now if you give it some input that it never seen before, it will be noise what's coming out. So you want to make sure that it actually understands that that the problem, the underlying um, data here, the underlying relationship between the data. So you always keep something on the side. And if you do go to a contest, uh, they will have another data that you've never seen because that that test data that we put on the side or we call it validation perhaps in this case and we can use that information say you know what this model actually wasn't so good let's try another model let's try, and this is model is the best but that means that we actually use that that validation also to choose the model so they eventually will test it with something that we've never seen before to to see how well we did at the end uh, but we'll just do that so now that we have these two frames, we want to take a model and, and train it with the first one and then test it on the second one. So where is that? So we can say build model. And this, uh, pay attention to this, uh, run AutoML. We will talk about it a little bit later, but basically AutoML is a very um, new, not new, but it's it's now very um, trendy. It's becomes very powerful. It basically can do a lot of this work for you that we're going to do now with build model. So I'll talk about it later. A little bit more. But when we go to build a model, 
So basically, it has a lot of algorithms here, and we can choose one. So in AutoML, it could it could maybe choose it for us. It could maybe choose parameters for us. So let's do uh, XGBoost, which is a kind of a collection of uh, of um, decision trees, which is extremely powerful implementation. And uh, now we have to set the parameters for it. So the first thing that's important is what are we going to train on? So we have two of them. Okay, what did I do wrong? Um, it doesn't show me. Did I not split? Okay, I didn't. I didn't finish that part. Sorry, I did forgot to finish the split. So hopefully, okay. I need to. I'm sorry. I have to go back one step. I'm going to cut this. When I did the split, I never. I never really clicked that create. So now it creates those two frames. So when I create a model, I will see those two frames because that model did not see them yet. They weren't there yet. So uh, now that I choose the XGBoost, it will hopefully see those two models, two, two frames. Yes, so I, I will tell it train on this frame. And this is my validation frame. And it will basically will train on the first one and it will evaluate on, on each one of them separately. And we will see the difference. And the response column, basically, it doesn't know. We have a lot of columns. We need to tell it which one is the output. And then the rest of them will be the inputs. So I'm telling it that the machine failure is the output. That's what I want to predict. And then the ignored columns, I'm going to say, I don't really want to, to look at all those columns that um, were the type of error. I just want to look at the... Actually, I want also to ignore these two things that were, <clears throat> if you remember, the first two columns are just a number that goes from one to whatever, and it doesn't give me any information. And the product name also doesn't seem, if you look at them, pretty much the names, all kinds of names that are not meaningful. So um, I'm ignoring these two columns. So now basically we have these columns these one, two, three, four, five, six, and one output. So we have six inputs, one output. And now come all kinds of parameters that are, are um, specific to this algorithm, to this XGBoost kind of model. Uh, for example, entries is how, how deep it's going to be, et cetera, how, how deep and how wide it's going to be. And I'm going to just leave them at default values, which are pretty good usually, but you could, uh, if you know more about it, you can change it. And then you have uh, advanced, um, parameters, and then you have expert parameters. So you have a lot of room to play around here, uh, but you you really uh, can can go lost here if you try to look into all of this. But it does let you do that. But we just skip to build model, and we use all the default parameters. So now it's basically going to do the training. Now it's the the process where it it gives it the in, the inputs, look at the outputs, the model corrects itself changes the parameters to try to match the output to the output we want. It's already done because XGBoost is very powerful, very quick, very efficient, and the data set is not very big. So, uh, and now if I do view, let's see what are the results. The thing is that there are many ways to look at results. There are many ways to evaluate the, the result. And one thing that I didn't show you, I was going to show you and I forgot. Let's go back for a second to our um, to the data, if you remember, I showed you here in the Excel spreadsheet that the machine failure can have the two values of zero and one. But if you look at it here, you will actually see that they're almost always zero. Very few examples actually have the error. So actually, if you if you look uh, more closely here, actually, it will tell you that 96 percent, 96.6 are are um, zeros, meaning everything is good. There are no failures. And only like 3.4% are the failures. So we could theoretically build a, a classifier that will always say one, no problem, and it will be uh, correct in 96% of the cases, which sounds great. But it's not going to give us what we want. Uh, it's not going to be any of any use for us. Yeah, we can't. I can't see what's in the boxes, unfortunately. Barely, it's, barely. It's uh, uh, it's, uh, it's for some reason it's got this shady color, but it just gives us the number. It says okay, okay it's ninety six percent. Got it. Okay. Okay. It's three point thirty nine percent. Right. Thanks. Same thing. It will give you the actual count. Got it. Okay. Uh, but uh, there, you can see it visually in what, what cases you can sort of see it. it's it's pretty much all of them are ones very so this is a problem that we have sometimes 
<laughs> when we want, we are knowing to, so you need to be aware of it. Uh, this is called an imbalan imbalanced um, data set because it's almost always. But that's just because of the nature of of the of that um, problem that we look at. That the failures don't happen most of the time. They don't happen, but still very important for us to know when they happen. So let's see how this plays when we we are going to evaluate the results. So we already know that we can do 96 percent accuracy, meaning the the time that we um, we are right, but it's not going to be very useful. So what we're going to look at mostly is something that's called the confusion matrix that I joked about before. This is the confusion matrix. So what you see here, uh, it's always the results here are always uh, first the training, which are going to be very good results because these are the result, the, the set that it was training on. And then you have the test, which are going to be not as good because these are new examples. Uh, so what we see here is the, the two yellow numbers here, the two yellow uh, um, squares here, or rectangles are the ones that were guessed correctly. So what you can see, these are these were supposed to be zeros, and they actually were predicted as zeros, and these were ones that were predicted as ones. And then we have very few errors. These are zeros that predicted as ones, and ones that predicted zeros. We call them true false, um, false negative, and false positive. Okay, that's what we call it. Uh, as you see, in this case, it was not as good. Uh, so we still did pretty good, but question is, can we do any better? But but uh, we have we have a lot more errors. And uh, now uh, let's look at the different way. There are many ways to look at all these results. And uh, as you as you just scroll down, you will see all kind of things. Uh, this is interesting because it looks a little different than what I I was I saw when I practiced it. But you you can see both of them are on the same graph. The orange one uh, is the test the or validation, and the blue one is the is the um, training set. So this is sort of an error that goes down as you train, uh, as you train and train. Oh, this is the number of trees. As you raise the number of trees, this error goes down, but the other error goes down, but it's not as, as good. So from this, you can see, think that maybe if we added more trees, if the parameter that was set to 50, if it was more, perhaps the error was actually, this was still going down, we could have maybe gotten better results. Um, for, but what I sort of wanted to look at is this ROC curve, which is how to explain exactly um, um, intuitively, but what, what we want to see is what we see here is almost a perfect corner. We want to be right here. If you are in this corner, there are no false positive and not false negatives. And in here, it's like almost there. It's very, very close. You have a few false negative, false positives. But this was the training set. In the, in the validation set, it's not, you're not there. So you can be here or you can be here. You can basically choose where you want to be based on some threshold because the the output is either zero and one, but it really is a number between zero and one that you decide to put a threshold and it will go either to zero or one. So if you make it closer to zero, then you will have more results that are one, etc. So you can as you as you go here. So for example, if you wanted to have no false uh, positives at all, then you um, come here, and what you will see is that. Uh, it's not even it's not even there, but you will see uh, there are six there are six six of these. So if I went down a little bit more, maybe here, let's put it here. There are still two. Okay, I'm sort of it looks like where I put it. There shouldn't be any, but this number goes down. This number will go up. Uh, but I actually I'm interested because in our problem in our case we we prefer. Our use case is we prefer to to say that there is a problem and let's replace the part. Uh, well, we need, I presume that this is how it is, uh, but it may be it may be actually depending on the cost of the parts. So, uh, but I would think that if the part is about to break, it's better that I say let's replace it when I when I don't really need to replace it than the other way around where I say let's not replace it and then it goes and breaks. So these are the two types of error: false positive, false negatives. In many cases. Uh, it's easiest to maybe refer to to a medical case where we diagnose someone as uh, like let's say somebody has cancer or not. It's better to say that they are they may have the cancer and then have somebody look at it than say oh, the person doesn't have a cancer and and they might have it. So we try to minimize the the false negatives. Um, yeah, another another example I've come across is like for large ore hauler trucks. Um, they, they monitor they, they monitor the wheels 
And these are like $10,000 wheels that stand two stories high. And if one of those wheels goes out, then that truck has to be, uh, it's really expensive to, to try to, to get that truck to a place where they can maintain it and then change the wheel out of the field, basically, I would imagine. So if they can identify what the symptoms are when that wheel is about to fail, then they save themselves a lot of money and they can keep that truck in production. Uh, and, and, and been productive a lot, a lot easier and a lot, a lot less expensively. Right. So what we have here, we can say, okay, we don't want it ever to happen that that the part will fail without us knowing. We prefer to replace the part. Uh, and so let's try to go to the other extreme, which is here. This is where it's uh, basically, oops. But what we see, so what we see here indeed, it, uh, we have no errors at all on the case of the errors. So on the case of the one, which is the failure, we are never mistaken, we always know. But what happens is, is basically, we always, always say, we almost always say 90% of the cases, we, we say that there is an error when there is no error. So it's not such a great situation either. Uh, so um, we, it depends now on the problem. We can decide, okay, let's compromise, put it here, put it here and uh, see what if the results are good enough for us. Uh, and maybe that's that's good enough. I'm not sure why it's not taking it. Let's try again. Okay, let's maybe that's good enough. We only have four cases of, uh, of failure out of 80. That's uh, And here we will have some. We, we can basically tweak it. Oh, we'll say, you know what, that's not good enough. We, we, we can't get uh, what we wanted out of this model. Let's, uh, let's, either try to get a model, uh, tweak tweak the parameters, get another model and try that out, get something more powerful. Or we might say, okay, there is no model that can that we can see that can give us the results that we want. We need more uh, information. We need to find more inputs, either more examples or more um, features that needed, need to be added to these features. And uh, we, will, we will have to just do better. Uh, by the way, what I didn't show you, is the variable importance. So a lot of those, uh, or some of those algorithms can show you at the end what was the uh, importance of each input. So we can see here the torque is the most prominent, um, most important to the result, etc. Why those types are not that important actually. Um, so that sometimes that has to do also with explainability. Sometimes when you have a model, we want to be able to explain more or less how, what the inner workings of it, of it to some degree because they're very, very black box like usually. So that helps sometimes to see, okay, uh, we can understand something from it. Does it make sense? This is also where uh, SMEs can say this makes sense or it doesn't. Um, okay, so let's say that we are okay with that model and we want now to utilize it so you can now go and make predictions with it. So one way to do it is um, using those all those buttons here. I'm just scrolling up and down looking for them because I sort of uh, added a lot of... So you can do predict. Of course, you can just write it down. These are the... When I click the button, basically what it does, it writes a command like in a notebook. But I never remember those. I just click the button. So when I do predict, it, does, it did that. And uh, now I can say what I want... Uh, there is only one model. I could do several models and choose them. And then, um, oh, again, it only, it only. I think I maybe I went too far back and it only knows about this frame, but I, I want the, the two frames. So maybe I'll go here. It's interesting that it, it depends where I clicked it. So now, actually, yes, I can select. Uh, so I want to predict the one that uh, the model was not trained on, but here I could bring basically a new piece of data, a new a new collection of rows that will be a new frame, and tell it to, to make predictions. But if I just tell it to predict those, it will it will also run all kind of. Uh, we actually saw that before because it's the same it's the same uh, test um, set that we used, and it, and it, it but it it comes out with that. so what you see here is actually there are all kind of ways to measure. Um, there are all kind of um, names of errors or, or types of errors or, or ways to evaluate the performance and they do different things. Um, the best, the best, the most uh, clear way is to look at the, to, to um, basically intuitively understand, understand them is to look at the confusion matrix, but from the confusion matrix you can calculate all kinds of things. So um, 
one of them will be just accuracy, like how many we got correct out of how many. We saw that in this case, if you just take the total of how many and how many, it's not necessarily a good a good way to to evaluate it because you can get 96% without working at all. Uh, so uh, sometimes you count the false negatives, the false positive, a combination of them. There are measures that are called F1 and F2 that are combinations that are used in many cases. Um, and you may see them further down here if I get there. Actually, I don't see them, but it should be here. F1 and F2 and, uh, and a bunch of others. Oh, they're right in the beginning, F1 and F2. Uh, and they're different. As you see, we can we can put different thresholds, and they, it will change. And then we can we can use that to decide what where will be the threshold that that will give us what we want, the best thing for us. Um, the next thing we can do uh, is to um, what do you think of this, Pojo? Um, actually, what this can do for us, uh, other than so beyond all this analysis and uh, understanding the problem and, and creating model, we can actually export a Java class that will implement that um, model that we what we created here, that we trained here. And uh, I can either do preview, I can do a, a export, etc. And they also have something called a Mojo that is more sophisticated, that is actually more compact. But if you just look at the Pojo, it's a Java class. It's very ugly because it's basically implementation of all these decision trees. It's a lot of ugly numbers, but uh, it implements that uh, that uh, model. So, uh, and, and I think it's called score zero. Score zero is the is actually the the method that you call to to. But you have a lot of documentation in this. I don't really want to get into details, but. What you could do now, if you wanted, is to copy this class, put it in your code, and uh, then you still need to. All you need to do actually is include the jar file that I use here when I when I launch that. The same uh, H2O jar, wherever we can find it. You notice that as I, as I walk, I walk with the notebook. It uh, it keeps printing stuff. Um, so, anyways, it's the same jar H2O jar. Uh, so you could do that, and and now you put you have you basically uh, have a classifier. Uh, and uh, you, you wanted to spend more time and do uh, auto ML, and it would maybe help you choose the best model, the best parameters, or depending on how much time you have to put into it, and then you'll take this and use that. Uh, also, everything we did here uh, manually, what it does, it sends REST requests to the web server, so you theoretically can have a program, and you actually have SDKs to do this, but not in Java. A Python SDK and uh, maybe Scala SDK, and uh, but you can you can do the same thing in Java, or you can actually call it directly because it is a Java code. If you get into it, you'll actually see how to use it. So you can actually write a Java program that uses the core of this H2O flow, or you can do it manually, or you can do something that use that imitates your REST requests in in any language really, to to go to to just go through this and create a model. Um, so I find it an excellent tool to to just as your starting point, look at the problem, look at what models, what what is happening there, and um, sort of a replacement to what data scientists will do with a Python notebook, and maybe better than that even. So back to our presentation. So um, I want, uh, uh, other than that, so another tool that is mo not mentioned in that book, but I have a, a series of blogs about it, and I will show you in a second. Um, so basically what I want to tell you is, is this, this is something very useful, but it's uh, more interactive, and you can also do more things with it. But if you just want a programming, um, a library to program with and do stuff programmatically uh, all the way, a Trivio is a relatively new uh, or newly released uh, Oracle library that uh, is a few months out now, and it's quite powerful, does a lot of stuff. I'm not going to go too much into it because I, I have a lot still to say, but it's basically uh, comparing to Python. It's a little bit more cumbersome than Python still, but it's uh, strongly type, typed. It uh, has something called uh, provenance, which is sort of useful. It remembers basically each model where it came from, what data it was used with, so it's sort of, it can prevent issues by using something on 
some model on something that it wasn't meant for. And it, it, you can actually take some models that were developed in Python or in other libraries and, and import them into that library and use them. And of course, it is an Apache 2 license. Uh, let me show you. Is it the next slide? Yeah. So originally, this presentation had the demo. I'm not going to go through it because it's getting long, but uh, this is sort of what the code looks like. I have it here. And uh, my, uh, as you see here, let's, let's just go to my blog for a second. So in my blog, I'm, I still did not send. Usually, I would, when I make a series like this, so there is a series of four posts here about a Trivio. And uh, I would uh, pack it, I would uh, compile it into an ebook and send it to the people on, on the mailing list. So this, I did not do that yet. I have people on my mailing list who still have to go here right now. If you want, you'll have to go here and read it. And you can access it directly from the sidebar here or with the link. I think I shared the link here, right? Did I put the link here? Yes, right down here. Um, but, or you can just go to AI4Java.com and go to the sidebar and click on the trivia thing. You'll get to this page. So uh, here uh, I go to, there is a lot more to Trivio that is not mentioned here, but I basically go to how you do a classifier and I use this wine quality data set where it's a, not, it's a real one where you have all kinds of information about wine, acidity, residual sh sugar, et cetera, and you need to evaluate what is the quality of the wine according to this database where experts have done that. Um, so, so, go back. so the, the last, Actually, I want to switch between the, the web here. So the last, um, let's say the climax of this series is where you create a REST service, which is a, a simple Spring Boot application, which you see here. So you have this, this, these four files. You have the application and you have the controller and then you have just two projects that represent the request and the result. So once you have this controller up and running, you can basically send a REST request that says, here, give me the wine quality, and these are the inputs. This is like the acidity, et cetera, and then it will return to you and will tell you that the quality is so-and-so, give you a, a prediction back. So this is how, in many cases, this is how uh, models are used. They are put on a server, they have an endpoint, you, you use them via REST, you send them something, you get something back with the result. So uh, this actually uh, gives you the implementation uh, example of how to do it in the case of Trivio. So basically, you, you train that uh, model also using one of these classes, the classification or regression. You save the model, and in runtime of this application, you bring it, you deserialize it from file, and then you just use it to make predictions as as the input or inputs are coming. So this is a one one by one prediction, more more like. Um, 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 streaming kind of operation versus batch where you would get like a whole data set sort of what we did in the in the user interface. So Trivio is definitely a tool that uh, is worth looking into. It's sort of new and it's still uh, not completely mature, but on the other hand, Oracle was using it internally for quite a long time. So it's 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 not like uh, it's pretty robust. Uh, and I'm marching forward because I don't want to hold you here all night. Uh, let's talk about neural networks and deep learning uh, quickly or sort of quickly. And actually, if you join my, my mailing list, you will get that first. My my first uh, information that my first blogs that I wrote were about deep learning. So I'm sort of giving you the uh, the background for it here. So neural networks uh, is made of uh, a neural network is made of uh, basic uh, units that are called neurons, and uh, and they're interconnected. So a neuron in real life looks like this. It's sort of imitating how our brain works to some degree. Uh, a neuron looks like this, and we imitate it by, by creating a piece, actually software. You can also do it in hardware, but the idea is there are many inputs that you see coming here from the left. There's one output that connects to many others, but uh, the, way we, the way it goes, uh, there are inputs in each one. The value of each input is multiplied by a weight, and then the result is uh, summarized, and there is some other constant added, and then it goes through some non-linearity, and that sort of um, turns this um, neuron into something that's not comp uh, sort of a nonlinear function of the inputs, and we can control it by changing the weights. And as we uh, we are said to learn and remember, etc., based on changing the weights and uh, changing who are we connected to, or, or how strongly we are connected to other, and how strongly we're connected is meaning the weights of of the other ones. 
Uh, so uh, basically, uh, it's sort of fascinating because by changing the weights, you can you can implement um, learning and memorization, etc. So um, because there are so many neurons and they're interconnected, then one one common way to use it is with layers like this. Uh, so you have neurons, you have inputs, and then each one, each layer is interconnected to the next layer through to everybody in the next layer. So you get a lot of weights. Each each line here has a weight in it on the input. Uh, and this is a small neural network, but this is the one in the middle here is called a hidden layer because we don't see it from the input and the output. And when I was young, we could either have one or two of these layers. And after this, it would become way too complicated to, to calculate it and even more complicated to try to calculate, to change the weights, to calculate how the weights should change in during the learning. Um, in recent years, a, a lot of advancements were made, improving the algorithms and also computing power. So now we can have even hundreds of layers in between. And this is what we call deep learning. Um, but we, before that, uh, let's just remind you that, uh, so we remember this example with the digits. So in this case, it would basically, each pixel would go, will be one of the inputs, and then inside of it, it will go through several layers, and then eventually we'll go into the outputs, which is what we're going to see here. Um, is everybody still awake? Uh, everybody's still here? I'm not sure, I can't, I can't see, but uh, let me just go there. I'm just, just checking before I continue. Um, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you for uh, and, that I'm not alone here. And so, you've answered a question I had. I was about to type it. Yes. Uh, I had heard, I'd read somewhere a long time ago something about nine layers in between, and you just mentioned there could be hundreds of hidden layers. Yes, there could so be. So yes. when the people are creating these models, do they start off with a whole lot of hidden layers and trim back to where they don't need? Because obviously there's processing time involved, or do they add layers as, until they? The, I, I don't think there is um, there are there is one one rule how to do it. Uh, right. There are all kind of architectures that were um, um, created over time, and I'm not sure people even um, tell you how they did that. Uh, but uh, you can you can you can take really, nowadays in many cases you will take uh, existing architectures and and just reuse them or, or tweak them a little bit. Um, but what I'm going to show is actually what we do is not just layers. It's we when it comes to application of uh, image classification I mentioned before. What happens is that there are many 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 pixels, not just so we have like the in, there are many inputs uh, that could make the the network even more complicated than we wanted. Plus, the pixels have some relations between them. So pixels that are close to each other can have more in common than pixels that are not. Uh, so uh, based on that, uh, the new kind of um, neural network was created. It's called uh, the convolutional neural network, or the CNN. And what you see here, the idea is, well, sorry. Uh, it's not exactly. Um, what I wrote here is that there are many, many hidden layers, but actually what is done is before you you come to that point with the hidden layers and, and with so what you see here on, on the right side, you have you have the same kind of network that we saw before, which can have a lot of layers. And they're all this is called a dense network. Each layer here is connected to the to the next layer, fully connected to the next layer. But because we don't want it to get uh, completely out of control, what what was done in this picture is not great, but the picture above it the, is is very good. The idea is here, here's a picture of a car. You want to know that it's it, it's an Audi versus maybe a Volkswagen. It will be very difficult to to even do that, uh, if, even for a person sometimes. But um, the idea is to have before you actually get into this into this layer is you have all kind of feature detectors. The feature detectors are the convolutional parts, and they will. You basically have what what each one of these circles will actually be consistent. Will could consist of uh, several cells, and they will basically uh, run over the picture, and make certain filtering, and uh, they will so, and they will do things like this. Some of them will detect lines of this angle. Some of them will detect lines of this angle. They will detect very low level features. Uh, and then they will sort of combine them together and and go to the next level. And now this can this can um, 
go and extract higher level features, which are maybe like a wheel or, um, or the license plate or the, the moniker on the car. And, uh, and as you go, and each time you will basically do this feature extraction and compression of it, uh, pulling pulling together. And uh, eventually, when you, when you have the higher level features, then it goes into the dense network that will try to actually make make the um, determination of what it is, etc. Or if it's a dog versus a cat or anything like that. So um, so this can create all kind of architectures. You, you, each one of these can be different size. You can decide to have several of these and then and then several dense layers and then go and do several other ones of these. And so you 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 can come up with. It. There are a lot of uh, possible what I call architectures of combination that you can do. And it could uh, it just uh, here is no good way to really tell what is the best or how to get to the to the one that is the best. So people usually cling to 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 some uh, architecture that are known to be um, a good starting point and maybe go and try to modify on them. Uh, again, uh, the subject of uh, auto and machine learning is uh, many many um, of those frameworks that do auto auto ML. They try to figure out these these architectures, and I will maybe have a slide about that. But yeah. meanwhile, I'll you show you here. Yeah, are you familiar with uh, Jeff Hawkins' book on intelligence? No. Okay. Well, uh, he he goes into analysis. He was fascinated with AI twenty plus thirty twenty five years ago, but decided to go into study of neuroscience, which was being ignored by the software folks, uh -huh. and what he learned was that picture you just showed with the car and then the little black and white uh, lines and so forth. That's how our own vision works. We do feature detection and there are patterns in the brain that says, yes, I, I look for high contrast for lines or I look for movement or whatever. So what you just showed me indicates people are using his ideas or the ideas to- yep. uh, it definitely sounds the same idea, yeah. So uh, they, they went with that. And actually, um, some of this applies also to uh, sound and speech because of uh, the nature of, uh, the temporal nature is more like the the to the images. And some, some other things can be done uh, with convolutional. And while while the things that we saw, we saw before, where the features are completely not really related to each other, um, temporally or uh, spatially, <laughs> We are we we just use a dense network, uh, so uh, this become this has become very very um, basically into a huge uh, field of uh, frameworks, very powerful tools for learning. TensorFlow maybe is the most famous one, and PyTorch is maybe the second from here. Uh, but uh, uh, these are mainly Python tools, and uh, TensorFlow is C++, and even the Python tools are actually written on top of C. And um, the question is, what do you do with Java? So Java has several, actually, by now. Deep Learning for J was uh, the first large one, which I think is covered with my blog to some degree. And uh, it, it is a Java library that has some implementation C++ internally. And uh, you can you can basically deep learning uh, schemes with it. A newer one is DJL from uh, from uh, Amazon. They made it as a um, open source library, and it has already a whole library of models. So if you and it and it also is a, it's actually built on top of other networks, but it gives you a good Java interface to work with, and you can write. A, and you can choose from a lot of uh, models that are e existing that uh, they call it the model zoo. So it's relatively easy to take something because you already have all these uh, models that can do a, a car detection or animal detection or, or look at a picture of a person and say the age and the gender and stuff like this. Then you can just choose a model and wrap it uh, or call it and, and utilize it in your Java program. And the demo site is very nice. You ought to go there. Uh, and then we have something that's called uh, deep nets, which is uh, written by a, a friend of mine, I would say, somebody that I know. <laughs> and it was the base of the uh, JSR. Oops. Where was I? Uh, there is actually a new uh, JSR, which is a Java spec for, uh, they call it visual recognition, but, but it's actually uh, deep learning and uh, machine learning, etc. 
and uh, the deep nets is sort of a reference, is a reference implementation of it, but uh, um, the interesting thing about it is that if you use the IDE, it has an IDE that makes it very easy to, to create uh, networks by uh, using a, a wizard. And if you ask you what it is, what is the problem you're trying to tackle? Is it a image classification, etc.? And it will help you uh, step you through it, which makes it uh, one of my uh, low hanging tools. Uh, but you can also use it as a library and just pro programmatically without any of the, the wizards. So it's worth checking out as well. Now I can to the subject of AutoML, which I mentioned already. So you will want to know what features are the best one to use, what is the best model, what will be the, what we call the hyperparameter or the learning parameter, which are the ones that we, we set that were like, in our case, were three levels of expertise, but each algorithm has those parameters that you set them before the learning, and they're called usually hyperparameters or learning parameters. And then sometimes you want to take several models and combine them together, make an ensemble, and the, all these things can, can be done uh, by AutoML frameworks that are many of them nowadays. I only mentioned a few here, but there are many more by now. And some of them cost money, some of them are open source. And um, they employ different uh, methods to, to find the best combination. Um, one of them is, okay, so here is my low hanging book that I mentioned before. Um, in any case, okay, actually, I uh, I don't show it here. But uh, my other book that talks about uh, genetic algorithms uh, show basically or genetic algorithms or evolutionary computation is one method that is used in some of those, like in Teapot. Uh, it used to find uh, the best combination of parameters, uh, architecture, layers, etc., and um, is utilized by... Uh, by AutoML uh, frameworks, alongside other other methods. Uh, one other uh, very uh, used one is um, Bayesian optimization. Um, okay, so uh, okay, I'll go back to this. If you didn't uh, scan it yet, you can do it now if you like, or you can reach out to me and I'll, I'll send it to you. And uh, I'll go back maybe to the beginning of the presentation. So if you want to also connect, connect with me, you can do it this way. Uh, so anybody still ha has energy um, for questions or for conversation, let's uh, do it. Do you have any questions, comments, corrections? I don't know. Uh, did I go too fast, perhaps, or too slow? I'm not sure. I'd like some feedback also because I probably will try to do this presentation again in, in other forms, and I'd like to improve on, upon it. Sure. Let me go ahead and stop recording so people can feel free to ask questions. Okay. Um, and again, uh, thank you for watching YouTube. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. I have a question. I'm retired. Um, yeah.